Hi, I'm Simon Hill, and you're watching Purebred Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. Hi, I'm Daniel Mullen, former Adelaide United player and Asian Champions League winner with Western Sydney Wanderers. When it comes to any of my soccer needs, I do my shopping here at Soccer Locker. An Australian owned and operated business, the store is located at Shop 5 of 181 to 183 Grange Road, Finden. Founded in 2017, Soccer Locker was introduced into the market to fulfil all the soccer related needs of Australians, providing a huge range of quality clothing and equipment ranging from soccer balls, team kits, goalkeeper gear, accessories and much more. Recently arrived stock also includes stunning retro kits from some of our favourite past eras as fans of the world game. Soccer Locker is a specialist in Premier range boots, Adidas and Puma, goalkeeper gear and licensed merchandise. Visit us online at www.soccerlocker.com.au with free delivery Australia-wide. So get shopping now at our Finland store, open from 10 a.m. to 5.30 p.m. from Monday to Friday, and open Saturdays from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. Today we're coming from Nelspreet, the magnificent new Bombella Stadium. New Zealand, the All Whites, against the reigning world champions, Italy. And Simon Elliott curls it in. Oh, and a touch in! New Zealand remarkably break the deadlock. Shane Smeltz takes the congratulations of the players. Well, a great flighty delivery from Elliot. It was Reed's flick. It was Cannavaro who couldn't really get any clean contact. Look who was there to just poke it in. Another remarkable story unfolding here. Risden Smeltz. Away by good again, and now Smeltz is on. Shane Smeltz ends the misery, and we have a goal in the final. Finally, and who else was it to be but Shane Smeltz? Well, we talk about him as a predator, and there he was at his best. I mean, really, it's a nothing ball into the box, and this time, for once, the Melbourne Heart don't deal with it. The long ball, here it comes in. Schmelz is actually the first one to challenge for that ball. It comes back, Jacob Burns, and I think Bass Vandenbrink gets a little touch on it, and who's there? Shane Schmelz, and it's a cool finish. Just slots it past, picks his spot, past Clint Bolt, into the far corner. It's a very cool finish from a striker in form. Schmelz again. Andre Zinho. McGarry waits in the middle. Far post this smelts. How well has he done there? The referee signals and it's a goal from Smelts. That is incredible. The A-League's greatest goal scorer has fashioned a second. And dipped and improved later, later on. Here Smelts right through the middle. It's been his night. It's the glory's night. And he's got a hat trick to boot. The rest of the teams in the Hyundai A League finals have got to watch out for Shane Smeltz. G'day, guys, and welcome to the Pure Red Reds Adelaide United Fan TV. I'm your host, Ellis Gelios, coming to you today with a preview of our game tonight at Cooper Stadium against Wellington Phoenix. And it's a red letter day for the show. I'm joined by the greatest player to come out of Oceania in modern football. He is, of course, Shane Smeltz, 180 A-League games, 92 goals, the third all-time top scorer in the competition's history, played for Adelaide United during the 2003-04 NSL season, 58 games and 24 goals for New Zealand, currently playing for Gold Coast United in the Queensland NPL. Smeltzy, uh, it's an absolute privilege to have you on the show. Tell us how you've been. There's so much going on. And uh, you're a very busy man uh, residing in the Gold Coast these days after your amazing career. Tell us uh, how you're getting on at the moment, mate. Ellis, thanks for having me, mate. Um, it's, yeah, certainly in, enjoying myself back here on, on the Gold Coast, um, sort of where I grew up. Obviously, I moved around a fair bit in my, in my, in my time, but um, Gold Coast always sort of felt like home for me. So myself and the family are back here. Um, just yeah, family life. Kids are going to school and uh, enjoying themselves back here. I've I've just started uh, my new football business, Shane Smeltz Football. 
Um, so pretty fresh with that um, and really enjoying that. Um, just getting that out to the market here on the Gold Coast and, um, and spreading the word with that. So very busy with that. Uh, still playing, still running around. Obviously, I stopped playing for a little while, but I just felt, you know, while I could, I may as well. And um, still having a run around with Gold Coast United. So a club, obviously, uh, in a different sort of format, but a, a club that sort of uh, resonates well with me back back in the day. Um, enjoying that in the NPL here. And, um, yeah, life's, life's pretty good. And uh, you're an occasional sideline reporter when Fox Sports are broadcasting from Brisbane as well, which is great to see that uh, you're still getting the run around when it comes to the A-League. So many special memories that fans from all clubs, not just the ones that you played for, will hold dear from uh, a spectacular time to be following the league back when you uh, got on board at Wellington in 2007. There's so much to get through, Smeltzy. Uh, obviously, a man that played for both Adelaide United and Wellington. We are going to preview the game tonight at Cooper Stadium. So as always, guys, uh, make sure that if you're not attending tonight, you catch all the action on Fox Sports and KO. Uh, it's a 7.05 kickoff. In terms of squad news, Yaya Dukali, Yared Abitu and Johnny Yal have all been promoted to our squad. Mohamed Toure is unavailable after being sent off last week. Smelty, let's jump straight into it. Wellington's last ditch win over Adelaide a fortnight ago was one of their best wins all season long. They entered this game having taken a solid point in Brisbane last week, which you watched, while Adelaide's entering this match off the back of their flattest performance that we've seen in a very long time. With Wellington's record in Adelaide being one of the worst in the A-League, do you think this is possibly the most favourable scenario the Knicks have found themselves in when preparing to play Adelaide in Adelaide? Obviously, you played in a lot of these games. Uh, so just tell us what your thoughts are on that. Yeah, I, I guess I guess that'll be certainly the way um, Uffi from, from Wellington, the head coach, they'll be, be spinning it to his players. Um, without a doubt, he'll be saying to them, look, we've, we beat them a couple of weeks ago. Um, we, we're going to them now and, and they'll be a bit nervous after last week's results. Uh, at home, he'll be saying the pressure's on them. Um, I don't know if I buy into that, to be honest. I think, um, you know, Adelaide have, have been been decent at home. They've always, in, history shows they've been good at home. Something special about Friday nights um, at, at High Marshall Coopers now. Um, but it's 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 a wonderful venue, a wonderful atmosphere, Friday nights there. And it always seems to entertain the, the people. So um, on the flip side, uh, I'm sure Carl Veer's going to be saying, you know, they done us a couple of weeks ago. This is our time to get at them at home. Um, and, and looking at where they are position-wise in the table, uh, they really need to make this one count. I mean, it's an important one for both sides. Um, Wellington have been sort of there, thereabouts. Uh, definitely need the points on the board as well. Um, but I think Adelaide, being at home, being in the position they are in the table, um, really need to come out and just prove a point that last week, the yeah, when they played last time was a bit of a slip up and, and we'll get at them this time. Uh, a lot of A-League veterans have come out in recent years and talked about how intimidating Cooper Stadium is. Uh, one that springs to mind is Ante Kovic, who was around uh, during your golden years. Uh, do you want to just reflect on some of the memories you've got from, from coming to play at Cooper Stadium as an opposition player? Is there really a, a sort of element of hostility in the crowd from uh, what you experienced back in the day? Yeah, maybe I'm not the right person to ask because I think for myself, my personal experience, every time, I, I mean, my family's born in Adelaide. So my wife's born in Adelaide. My, my two daughters are born in Adelaide. So, and I played in Adelaide. Um, so I always had a, an amazing experience coming back. It was almost like coming home in, in a way for me as well, no matter what team I played for. So I, I love the occasion. Um, but I did, you're, you're right, I did always sense... Um, you know, in the dressing room or, or, the, or the day before but coming to Adelaide was always in their mindset, in the team's mindset, was it was a tough trip. Um, and definitely, as I said before, something about Friday nights there uh, causes a bit of um, anxiety against with, with the opposition. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what it is. It's, it's, it's definitely a difficult place to go, especially if you know Adelaide, uh, are playing good football and are in form. It's an extremely tough place to go. Um, but personally, as I said, I always, you know, found it an amazing place to play. I always loved those occasions. Um, 
you know, I enjoy scoring goals at that ground and, and it, it felt very comfortable for me. Wonderfully said, Smeltz in. We love uh, hearing about that Adelaide connection. We're going to get more into that later on in the interview, but we will look ahead. Uh, so Adelaide United looked very much toothless against Western United last weekend. It appeared the match was there for the taking with a one-man advantage and Western United parking the bus. However, Adelaide United looked uncharacteristically poor in front of goal. Do you think Western United have potentially exposed Adelaide as being a one-trick pony with no plan B when there's no space to play into in the final third of the field? Or do we have nothing to panic about just yet as it's only one game? Yeah, I'd probably lean to, to the latter in that. I think, um, once again, if I was Carl Vier, I'd be saying, you know, yes, we need, to, we need to be a bit more creative and make sure we are controlling the game and, and get that goal that we need. That's what it's all about. But it's a difficult one to train for. It doesn't matter who you play for. Whenever you're in that situation, um, you're going out uh, 11 by 11. And then when, when, when the opposition, you feel like their back's against the wall, they dig in in a different way. Um, they sit in. Uh, and you look at Western United, I, I think that actually suits some of the players that they've got. You know, Durante and the, and the others at the back there. They, they, they thrive off that a little bit in, in terms of we just need to hold out here. Um, you know, I'm not so sure it looked, they look threatening the other way. Just Adelaide really couldn't, couldn't get anything decent on goal. Um, and that's, that's a learning moment for them. It's, you know, it may happen again. It may be in finals football that that happens at home and they need to, need to be able to convert something. So um, I'm sure they'll look at it. And, and as you say, you know, you can talk about plan B and C and, and just have another avenue in which they, they'll look to score. But it's, it also comes down to players wanting to stand up at that moment. I think, um, you know, who's really willing to say, give me the ball when it's tight and, and actually create something. Um, but it's, you know, from, from past experiences, it's always, even as a striker, it's difficult to sort of get on the ball when you know a team's parked in there. I think the only reassuring thing for Adelaide United fans tonight is that uh, under Ufuk Tale, at least Wellington are just purely a ball playing side. And I'm not sure they've got that in their DNA to do what Western United did last week. But uh, nevertheless, we'll uh, keep our eyes peeled to see how it all unfolds. Now, Wellington Phoenix, the, the club you reinvented yourself at when you first signed in 2007, what have you made of their stuttering season so far, Smelty? Um, every time I've seen them play, for me, they've been one of the most entertaining teams this season. Um, I love their style and their brand of football that they're, they're trying to play. Um, the only question mark over it is that they probably haven't picked up enough points that they'd like to. Um, they'd like to be, I'm sure they'd like to be in a high position on the table. Although it's still fairly tight, you know, things go their way and they get a couple of results, they're, they're right in there. Um, but yeah, they have been, they've been entertaining. I think they've scored some, some great goals. Um, they've moved the ball around really well. I know um, Ulfi, head coach from, from my time when I was at Sydney FC a little bit there, he obviously was assistant at Sydney FC and he's, he's taken a lot from what they do there across, across the ditch, I think, um, although they've been based in, in Wollongong. Um, but, and then he's added his own little flavour to it. I think you know, he's allowed players to be free in the, in the, in the final third, um, the Villa has been great again. He's, he's sort of their, their engine, everything sort of goes through him and he creates everything. Um, so yeah, they've been really good. The only question mark is, is the points and where's, where's their mentality at? Are they a team that's, you know, happy just to play good football or are they a team that's, that's going to go to finals and really, really do something? That's my only question mark over them at the moment. Does Toma Hamed's form worry you? He's only just started scoring. Do they uh, need to almost rely on you dusting your boots off at this stage, mate? <laughs> I don't think I'll be getting the call at this stage. Um, no, look, I, I look at them. I think they've got some good players, some good young players and some good young Kiwi players as well coming through, um, helping out. But then it comes back again to that experience in the big games. You know, they're, they're doing well here and there. Um, can they consistently do well? And you mentioned Hamed, you know, he's been on and off. Um, sort of a, a big, sort of decent signing for them and, and probably expected to do a little bit more. Um, but who knows, uh, with the run in now, you know, he may, he may step up to the plate. 
Well, we can only hope for Phoenix fans that he does, but uh, not tonight at least. Uh, now, speaking of another Phoenix player and an import for that matter, Stevie Taylor, who's been a real revelation since joining Wellington uh, a number of years ago now, the big English centre-back, he's said that he's um, happy to remain at the club beyond this season, but the club hasn't entered into any contract talks with him as yet. Is this worrying at all for Knicks fans, Smelty? Uh, potentially. I mean, they'll probably start to think, you know, what's going on behind the scenes. I think it's more of a one, you know, it's not so much a question for the player and the coach and the, and the team, I think. I think, uh, you know, if I look at the situation, I think he enjoys himself there. Um, that's more most likely the reason he came back to the club. Um, is, he, is he enjoyed his football there? He loves his football. I think he's a player that really suits Wellington. Um, he's that sort of um, hard on your sleeve type of player and, and defends really well um, and is a leader for the team. And I think they needed that, uh, certainly at the back. So the fit and the mould for Stevie Taylor is very good, I think. Um, but what's going on behind the scenes, we don't know. Um, what the club's thinking financially, future-wise, I'm not sure. So I think it's more of a question for, for them. But... Um, Definitely for, for the team and Uffi, you'd like to think that they would be trying to sort that out pretty quickly. No doubt about it. Uh, and just speaking about Wellington still, um, they've obviously had some real struggles having to base themselves in Wollongong all season long. Now, you played in front of the New Zealand crowd there at the Cape Tin for many, many glorious years. Um how much has it impacted them this season in 2021? Because obviously for players having to relocate permanently, uh, some without their families, it's going to have a massive toll. Um, obviously, you probably never got close to experiencing anything like that. But if you can put yourself in their shoes, how much do you think it would impact them? Yeah, I think certain players it would have impacted more. Um, certainly the, the New Zealand players, the Kiwi players, that have got their family over there and you know they're obviously you know everyone loves being at home uh week in week out preparing for games um but in saying that there's a lot of aussie players and foreign players that i remember when when i played there it was always a pleasure to 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 leave wellington and, and actually come over to australia and play your games so you know half the half the team there's a lot of aussie boys there as well um I'm sure they, they, they were loving staying in Wollongong. Uh, probably easier to stay in family and, and get in touch with people. And um, from what I saw from from some of the players in, in Instagram, I don't follow them all, but some of them, yeah, they were having a great time in Wollongong. Um, they really embraced the area. Uh, I think, you know, the venue down there is very good. Um, and they really made that their, their second home. You know, they, they changed the color of the strip. Um, so I don't think it hurt them as much as we think. Although, when they do go back, it's, it's definitely a, a more difficult trip for away teams to go there, that's for sure. Um, and, and I think that will certainly help them. Yes, and uh, it will be interesting to see how they adapt to playing back at home very soon. They've got uh, an away game tonight, then one more away game, and then they'll be back in New Zealand, which will be a real special moment for us all to see. Uh, now, I'm going to put you on the spot a bit here, Smelty, uh, Ufi Tale, the manager of Wellington, they've obviously been very, very entertaining under his um, stewardship in, in the time that he's been the manager there. Um, there's been a few managers that have come in since you were there, obviously some real solid years under Ricky Herbert, made the finals for the first time in the club's history under Ricky when you were there. Um, how crucial is it for Wellington to keep Ufuk Tala going forward? Do you think he's really the answer for them to be um, more than just a side that relies on winning at home and then, and then getting a point away and, and actually being a real dominant force one day in the A-League under Ufuk Tale? Because... Perhaps looking at last season, you know, they were on the road to being that. So is Ufuk, is Ufuk Tale crucial to Wellington having a prosperous future in at least the short term in the A-League, do you think? I think definitely in, in the short term, that's for sure. Um, I think if they if they keep chopping and changing the coach, the head coach too much, they, they have to start again every time, every season. Um, you know, Mark Rudin went in there. Uh, you mentioned Ricky Herbert in the past. Was, was some very good years there um, and, and then it sort of they lost their way a little bit for a little while um, couldn't find the right manager 
Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Mark Rudin goes in there and installs some some really good things into the club. Uh, the culture comes back in. You know, he promoted Kiwi boys. Some young young players were coming through, um, and they they were performing really well. They had a really good blend of players, seniors to, to youngsters. Um, then he leaves, uh, and then in comes Uffi, and you're like, well, you know, where's it going to go now? Are they going to stay on track, or are they going to fall off and have to build again? And to be to be fair to, to Uffi's credit, he's he's done a, a run, um, lost a couple of players and brought some new ones in, but but kept that that same uh, same line of ambition uh, for the club, um, same quality, same demanded the same quality from the team, uh, and I think they've just stayed on track with that. Um, as I say, the only question mark is where they are on the table. Can they get themselves a little bit higher? But if he was to leave. Um, you know, does that does that mess things up again for the club, and then they, they have to start again? I think I think the answer is yes, but uh, in the short term, definitely need, need to need to probably keep him and keep building on what they've been doing over the last couple of years. Well, at least for Phoenix fans, they know that he won't be going to Melbourne Victory. But uh, whether he does go somewhere else is yet to be seen. Now, another former teammate of yours who you played with during your one season here in the NSL, Carl Viet, obviously the manager here now, Smeltzy. How do you assess Adelaide United under him and whether we are truly a contender this season? Yeah, well, obviously, um, yeah, played with Carl Viet. He was, you know, the back end of his career in the, in the NSL there, and, and obviously just as it went into the A League, um, he was he was a great player. Even then, at the end of his career, um, great guy to have around the dressing room, and and was, was a real leader. Although you know he was reasonably quiet, but he was definitely a leader for the team. Um, and and you know he's been in the club now for a long time in in the background uh, with, with youth youth players, and I think that's been. That's been probably the biggest asset to the club and for himself, I think, uh, coming into this role now as head coach, because you've seen the transition. You look through the squad, um, there's a lot of young players. Um, I think, I think you know, I was, I was having a look before at the, at the age of most of the players and it's a, it's a fairly young squad. Um, you know, you've got 17-year-olds in there, 18s, 20-year-olds, um, even your captain Stephen Mork, he's he's 25. I mean, for a captain 25, it's, that's that's a young captain. So, um, and you've got you, your senior players in there are still only 29, 30. I, I'm not sure there's too many over 30. So it's a young squad. He's gone that way, and and really looking at youth. And I think the youth players that have come in, um, it looks to me from the outside as if they trust him and they know he's going to give them a go. And it's not just throw one youngster in, see how he goes, and he's and he's out if he doesn't perform. He's he knows them from years before. It looks like um, he knows which ones to play. He's got their back, and I think that's a healthy environment for the club. When you've got, you know, a lot of clubs, if you look around, they have their senior players, you've got your, your middle-aged players, and a few youngsters. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think Adelaide's towards the the earlier stage in that, and having more youngsters, uh, and. And it's like they're competing against each other. You know, it's it's who can be the the, the star of, for the week, um, who's going to potentially get some interest from overseas. So they're all pushing each other. And I think it's a really good environment uh, for the club and, and credit to the people in the background at the club and and Carl Viet for, for allowing that to, to, to be there. And just on Carl, when you were there in the NSL season, you spoke about how he was a real leader. Did he take you under his wing at any point? Obviously, as a young striker that you were then, and uh, you know, give you a few tips before or after training. Was he was he that kind of character at all? Um, no, he was more he was more lead by example. To be honest, um, yeah. To be honest, when I went there, he was playing. I think he was playing uh, centre back. He was playing. He was playing all over. He, you could utilise him everywhere. Um, but I remember he was playing at the back and he was still dribbled through and, and he was good on the ball. And then when he was asked to play up front, obviously he knew what to do, um, scored goals. Um, but he was just one of them that, that um, just always went about his business professionally, um, training and games. And, and he would always just be, be, be on his game. Uh, and I think that was the biggest thing as a young player looking up. Uh, I think it's so important in any environment, even now, you know, if I'm at the NPL club, 
your young players are looking up to you and seeing just what you do, whether it's training or or games. So, um, you know, I really enjoyed those those years. There was not only Calvi, there's a lot of good senior players in that team. Um, and, uh, and certainly learned a lot just watching them. Yeah, beautifully said, mate. Well, uh, it's come to the point of the interview where I've got to ask you for your predictions. So as a uh, occasional Fox Sports personality, uh, might be throwing you on the spot again, but who comes out on top tonight? Uh, tough one. I'm looking forward to it. I think um, something tells me Adelaide United are going to be too strong. I think they're going to be annoyed at uh, losing to Wellington last time. Mm -hmm. um, I think they're going to be extremely annoyed at last week um, in the nil-all draw at home. Um, and I think they're going to have too much to, to prove this time around. Um, and to be honest, if they are going to be, you know, title contenders or, or get themselves in a great position come the end of the season, season which will come around fairly quickly and, and looking to get home finals and all the rest of it, um, they really, it's, it's a game they really need to, uh, to make sure they come out the right end and get the three points. And as someone who played as many games as you did, if, if you were playing in this game tonight, what would your message be to the players for that first five or 10 minutes? Would you want them to play their regular game for Wellington Phoenix or would it be a case of uh, try and frustrate the opposition as much as possible, hit them on the break early on and then we sort of set into our rhythm? I can't see them changing the way they play. Um, you know, I, I can't see them going there and sitting back. I'm sure that they'll be asked to be organised because they know, yeah, Adelaide can certainly hurt you on the, on the break. They'll need to be organised. The, the rest defence, I know Wolfie will be telling them to make sure, you know, when we attack, we need to be switched on for what they can they can bring to us. Um, they've got pace, you know, out wide. They've got pace up front. Um, and they've got players that can sort of, Adelaide have got players that can hurt you all around the pitch if you let them. Um, but I think I think Wellington will come and play their style. They'll, they'll look to try to dominate possession if they can. I think they'll look to create things. Um, and, and it's going to be a game, I'm not sure about the first 10, 15 minutes, but after that, I think things will open up for, for both teams because they both like to play um, and you'll find space. I expect goals tonight, to be honest. Great insights from the Kiwi Goal Machine. That does us for our preview. Smelty, we're going to move into your biographical career and what a career it was third all-time leading goal scorer in the history of the A-League. Um, before we really get into it, Smelsi, I just want to ask, so born in Germany now, um, is there a German background at all? And did that uh, play a part in, obviously, your introduction to football? Uh, not so much. Um, yeah, German name. Uh, there is a... Uh, there's German on, on my, my father's side, um, going back a, a fair way, though. Um, but no, I mean, I was born in Germany simply because my father was in the American army. Um, my mother's born in England and they, and my father was uh, shipped at the time to Germany for, in the army. So, um, yeah, that's how that came about. A bit of a strange one, but um, and my sister's born in New Zealand. Uh, so we're all born, you know, everywhere. A uh, real mixed bag. Um, and look, I mean, on my mother's side, there was more of a football influence coming from England and with her father um, and on my dad's side, not so much. Um, you know, he grew up in New Zealand, more rugby at school and that sort of thing. Um, but I just found myself, yeah, I found myself with the ball at a very early age. Um, I guess people think that obviously born in Germany and think that's where the, the footballing side come from. Something I've always wondered, I'm sure many, many others have too. Uh, now, we're going to approach this in a bit of a different way. I, I really want to establish the Adelaide connection before we talk about your career generally smelty because it's something that's never really been highlighted. There's a few articles locked away uh, in, the, in the Google databases that uh, – almost touch on it a little bit from uh, back in a time when you were very nearly signed back to Adelaide United in around 2013. But a lot of fans here 
particularly uh, the younger breed of Adelaide United fans would not be aware at all of the connection that you have with this city. Um, so really the first phase of your career was a real journeyman-like story. You played for Gold Coast City, Brisbane Strikers, the Napier City Rovers, and then here in South Australia, Adelaide City, Metro Stars, two of the biggest MPO outfits that we've got, and obviously Adelaide United in our foundation season uh, before you then moved on to uh, Mansfield Town, AFC Wimbledon and Halifax Town in England. Um, but it was when you signed for Wellington in the A-League that really put you on the map in 2007 as a household name. So before we really dive in, I want to discuss your stint here in Adelaide and really highlight the connection you have to the city, which extends beyond just playing here. As you said off the top there, daughter born here in Adelaide and your wife's from here too. So let's discuss your Adelaide night experience in the old NSL under John Cosmina. Seven games and one goal. Uh, what are your standout memories from that short period? Just for um, just to note as well, it was a spectacular time here as uh, in our foundation season, the sport in South Australia was really popularised. There was a real unification again after that dark period of the, uh, the late NSL years in the early 2000s. So what really um, stands out for you from your time playing in South Australia at the very beginning of your career? Um. I think I think it's got a real sort of some some mixed emotions for myself. I think obviously uh, you know with my family being born there, um, you know many things happened for me there. You know, I sort of bought my first house when I was young there. Um, um, you know, really enjoyed my, my time um, in Adelaide. Uh, you know, great city, great people, great food. Um, you know, I, I grew up in Queensland, so I, I got introduced, you know, through my wife, all the, the culture and that side of things down there, and I loved it. Um, so I moved, uh, you know, we, I mean, we could talk about this for hours, but I, I was I was at Brisbane Strikers in the old NSL under John Cosmina, um, and I was there for two years, uh, and I and I left for whatever reason. I left. Um, I went and had one season in in. New Zealand National League, where I got Player of the Year, top goal scorer, and you know I wanted to get myself back to Australia. So it was sort of like a you know stepping down to come forward again, um, and uh, and I got seen uh, at the time obviously by Adelaide City, um, brought me over, and I couldn't have been happier. You know I was playing for for a great club, Adelaide City, um, was fit, was scoring goals, was was still quite young for the NSL, and you had all the old experienced players around. We, as I mentioned before, we had a great squad in, in Adelaide City there. Um, so I was really enjoying my time. Uh, and then that was at the back end of the NSL and the A-League was coming in. Uh, but there was that there was that big gap there. I think it was like eight, eight, nine months where a lot of players went and played local football and and really didn't know how to fill that void. Um, but the during that time, the back end of that NSL season, I I had an injury. Uh, which was, you know, what they what they used to call, they still may call it osteitis pubis, uh, which was, you know, a groin injury, which you can't really pinpoint exactly what it was. Um, and that was a really hard time for me because that was when it came to Adelaide, uh, Adelaide United was the first thing. So John Cosmina then comes through the door and, and is working at the club. Um, and I was almost injured the whole season. I played a couple of games, you know, in pain, trying to get through it um, and it came to the end of the season and, and then it was so, sorry that was the last season of the NSL yeah and then it was coming into A-League um, just to be just to be sure on that so uh, and at the end of the season uh, you know I, I had one of those conversations that uh, a lot of player football was have in their in their time it was a bit of a, a tough moment but I had the um, knock on the door and, and and go in and see the head coach John Cosmeda at the time and he's and he um, basically had to let me go. Uh, he sort of said, you know, what have you done this season? And I was like, well, mate, I've been injured. Um, you, you know what I can do. And, and obviously, you know, as a player, you always back yourself that you'll get through an injury and you'll come out the, the other end. Um, it wasn't to be for me at the time. And, and I was forced out the door at the club, um, which was really tough to take because I had settled into Adelaide um i loved it there you know my wife was from there um i really enjoyed my, my time at adelaide city before that and I just sort of thought that would flow into into the a-league coming up um so the first couple of years for the a-league for me wasn't wasn't to be um i had that gap and i was i was sitting there wondering what i was going to do 
um, and I made the decision to, to move overseas, um, not knowing many people. Uh, made the call to go and have a, have, have a crack overseas. Um, still injured at the time. Uh, so it was, a, it was a really tough one uh, mentally to go through. Um, but I think those, those moments are what sort of make you and, and you know, you sort of store that away and, and, and want to prove to yourself and prove to other people that you, you're not done and dusted. Gutsy stuff. And of course, you would very much go on to prove yourself in spades. But just before we get into all that, I'm going to call it now. John Cosmina's biggest regret as a manager letting you go. <laughs> how, how different things could have been because if you look at the timeline Carl Beer was about to retire when we went into the A-League we then had Fernando Rec but after Fernando Rec we struggled for a while to find a goal scoring striker tried Cristiano had one good season didn't quite work out for him and then we're going later into managers well beyond John Cosmina but aside from a certain Sergio Van Dijk never really found that golden number nine and he was right under our nose. Uh, so it, I, I'm well, going to call it. Yeah, just, sorry, an interesting fact, just an interesting fact on that. I played, so as I say, I'm still running around for Gold Coast United. We played uh, Brisbane Strikers last week and the coach is John Cosmina and I scored. So it's, uh, it, it's a small world, mate. It's a Good small stuff. World. I hope you rubbed it in as well, mate. Because uh, <laughs> he'd have a few regrets, John Cosmina. He's a very, very respectable man, obviously. Had some great years here over two stints, but uh, he made a few questionable choices in his time. And that's certainly the biggest one for me. But uh, Smeltzy, we'll move on. So uh, getting into um, the Adelaide connection just quickly uh, off the pitch. Obviously, you've spoken about um, the fact that your daughter was born here. You met your wife here as well. Um, just tell us, we're going to fast forward a little bit. Um, 2013, it didn't work out. There was interest, intense interest to bring you back here. Um, can you sort of outline why that never came to be? Because uh, it would have been fitting for all parties, I imagine. We uh, just couldn't find a reliable number nine to save ourselves. And uh, there you were having these Adelaide connections, obviously a past player too. Why did it never come to be? Yeah, I remember the time... Um... Uh, pretty clear actually it was uh, so I was I was playing at Wellington Phoenix at the time um, I had uh, you know a fair bit of interest to come back to Australia from from various clubs um, and obviously I, I ended up going to Gold Coast United and signing there three years um, I just felt you know my heart was set on that I you know, I was coming home where I sort of grew up yep. uh, a new club um, I just saw the excitement around that and the, and the team they were trying to build. And I just thought that was, that was the right move for me. Um, you know, which in hindsight was, was great. You know, I came from, I think I got Golden Boot and Johnny Warren the year I left Wellington. Yeah. Um, and I came, came into Gold Coast and, and got, uh, I think I scored 19 goals in the first season and Golden Boot again. Um, and that was the year leading into, into the World Cup in 2010 so I had a good few years um, of some good football without injury and had a real good flow about my game so you know looking back I made the right call um, but it was uh, a tough call at the time I remember having a conversation I was actually in Adelaide because I think we played Adelaide or, or I stayed over in Australia uh, for an away game I was in Adelaide with my wife and my family and I had the call and I spoke to Aurelio Vidmar at the time who um, Obviously, he knew, you know, I know him well. I played with him um, and I have a lot of respect for him. Um, and I'm sure I would have enjoyed my time playing under him as well. Uh, he definitely wanted to sign me. He was clear about that. Um, he knew that my family was, was from there and he, he potentially played on that one as well. But um, it's, yeah, it, it definitely made me think. Even though my heart was set on Gold Coast, it did make me think, and, and am I making the right decision? Um, because, as I say, I'm sure I would have enjoyed my, my football there as well because it, it did feel like a, a second home. Um, so it was it was close. It was in the in the mind on, on whether to, to to come to Adelaide or not. Um, it just just didn't get over the line. How different things could have been if we did get you over the line in that season. But uh, again, that's the way football goes, and uh, no one's going to begrudge you for going back to the city that you grew up in to play your football. Um, now, let's move on. So, England Smelter, you played for some respectable clubs, obviously, AFC Wimbledon, a former Premier League outfit. Um, 
why was Wellington in 2007 the next move you'd make? Because he scored a fair amount of goals in England. Yeah, it was a, it was a funny one. Um, I was over there for two, uh, probably two years, just over two years, possibly. Um, and, I, and I think that period there, there is really where I grew up as a footballer. I think, you know, I was on my own, away from family. I just had my wife. Um, well, we, we, we were engaged at the time. So, um, but it was, it was just a, a time where I was playing. I went from playing in the NSL. Um, I think I played you know, 14, 15 games that season, which was pretty normal in Australia, in the NSL, uh, to, to going overseas. And I played... And I had a few trials at the, at the start and then I just needed to find myself somewhere to play. And it ended up being AFC Wimbledon, which is a you know, fantastic club. Um, you know, branch off from the old Wimbledon um, and a club I, I knew straight away. And I, kept, and I keep my eye on them now. And a club I knew we were going to climb the ladders. Um, really good fan base, all about the fans. You know, even back then at the lower leagues, they were getting 3,000 easy to a game. Mm -hmm. uh three four thousand and you know they would travel everywhere um and it was just great i was playing tuesday saturday tuesday saturday for the whole season i, I think i played something like 52 games in in the season going from playing 15 and you know it was english football it was it was you know you'd play at times and then you get pitches that you couldn't play and it was a long ball and you had to deal with things and and i just sort of grew up as a as a player um as a man, I guess, as well, uh, and as a striker. So, and then when I came back to the A League, back to Wellington, um, you know, playing in, in front of TV and nice stadiums and get back to sort of 20 games a season, it was, it felt easy for me. Um, but yeah, so it was, it was definitely, uh, definitely a moment there where, um, as I say, I, I sort of grew up, grew up there and, and, I think that was the decision. So we, we had a game against Wales, an international game. Um, and I hadn't, I didn't have a new club at the time in, in, in the UK. Uh, I was still looking for a club. Um, I had my first child on the way. Um, and I, uh, I made the call to come back. So Ricky Herbert was obviously the national team coach. Uh, we played Wales. And there was, you know, Ryan Giggs, Craig Bellamy. They had a, they had a decent team, Wales. And we drew... 2-2 uh, in Wales, in Wrexham. Uh, and I scored two goals. Uh, and Ricky Herbert was like, look, man, you, you, you're coming back with me. So I was one of the last players signed for, for Phoenix. Um, I just felt comfortable with that. I'd done a couple of tough years in England and I was like, you know, I think I'll take this road um, now and having a kid come along the way and a bit more security. Um, and as I say, when I got back to Wellington, I just felt great. I'd gone from a couple of tough, tough years and everything seemed a little bit easier for me there. And, and uh, I just sort of flourished that first season. You would have thought, though, that they'd been monitoring you for a while. It must not have just been that one game where you scored a brace because obviously New Zealand passport, you're scoring bang loads of goals at a decent level still. And this is a club that's being formed out of nothing. Uh, you, you think they were keeping tabs on you? Yeah, it's an interesting one. I mean, I had a I had a very interesting conversation with Ricky Herbert, and he won't mind me saying, you know, I, I remember, I remember, you know, you talk about sliding door moments in football, um, and I, I had a conversation on the phone, and at the time I wasn't starting striker for the national team. Um, I hadn't scored many goals for the national team. I, I was always on the bench and getting parts of games here and there, um, and my club my club football hadn't kicked off. I was a late developer in terms of settling in somewhere and, and really finding my feet. You know, I was, I was, I'd been to many clubs and, and still trying to find my way, my way to, to where I wanted to get to. Um, and yeah, I had that conversation with him and I actually said to him, Ricky, I'm not going to come on this game. I, I need to find myself a club. You know, my club football is my bread and butter. Um, I can't, I can't afford to sort of miss, miss the boat and, and go and, and play a, yes, a nice couple of international games, but um, I really need to go on trial somewhere or whatever it is and, and get myself a club. He ended up talking me into to playing the, the national team game. Um, the other game got called off, which was against Ukraine, I think at the time, and we only had that Welsh game. So I was going to go over there and potentially be on the bench again. And just before, the, a few days before that game, uh, I think that we had a couple of guys pull out 
um, that would have started in front of me. So I end up going from bench player to starting and then scoring two goals. And it's it was kind of like that that moment there where, um, you know, even in the UK, so I decided mentally I was going to leave the UK, but I was doing an interview after the game and got handed two or three numbers of clubs there to call from, from agents and whatnot as I was talking. So um, it was a real sort of funny moment. Um, you, you know, you work so hard for a number of years for things to turn, and that was definitely a, a, a turning moment in my career. Extraordinary stuff. Uh, this this is just gold. Um, so obviously, you then you join Wellington. Needless to say, uh, an amazing moment for you in your career to play at the Wellington Phoenix. Just just some amazing memories. I, I remember just feeling as though um, feeling relieved, if anything, for Wellington because they really needed to get it right early on. And we know that it took them a couple of seasons to make the finals. But to have a, a local Kiwi in there scoring bucket loads of goals season in, season out, um, you know, made them very watchable and, and there was an element of excitement there. And it, it, it was a real relieving time, I think, given how hard uh, the New Zealand Knights fell on their face back uh, before Wellington were formed. But uh, Wellington, an amazing time. Obviously, you, you must have some seriously fond memories from your first stint at the Phoenix. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, even now, watching them now, you know, they, they, they still feel like one of my teams. Um, just watching them and just seeing, you know, the, the badge, it, it, just, it just resonates well, well with me. Um, but yeah, that, that, that time, it was great. I mean, I've been to a few clubs now that have had that, that start-up feeling and Wellington really did it well. Um, they sort of embraced the city. Uh, Wellington, as you know, is a, a fairly small city. You can walk around it um, and everybody sort of got on board. Um, the playing group was great, um, uh, and everyone sort of got along. It was it was a good mix of New Zealand players, Australian players, and foreigners. And um, as I say, it just it's just it, it, for me, it was like coming back to a place where I enjoyed myself. I wanted to be, um, and 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 I was wanted as well, which was which was great. It always makes it easier for a player when you are wanted. Um, and you d I didn't have that feeling of um, obviously you need to perform and train well and then get yourself in the team and, and, and stay in there. That's your job. But um, I just sensed that, you know, if I, if I did that, uh, put everything into it, trained well, scored goals on the weekend, that, you know, that, that was going to continue. And, and, and after the couple of years or the few years I'd had before that, you know, being released at Adelaide United, um, a couple of tough years, in the UK, um, grinding out week in, week out. Um, and those years really toughened me up. And when I come back here, I wasn't going to let it go. So I was going to perform every week. I was going to try and score goals and stay, stay where I wanted to be. A real interesting mix of personalities and characters in those early Phoenix teams. Uh, like we've highlighted so many great moments. Um, did it feel like it was only a matter of time before the club was going to make finals for the first time? Because certainly a very competitive club. Uh, obviously, you know, there's no need to highlight how how difficult it is when you're having to travel overseas every second week. Um, so did you feel like it, it was only a matter of time under Ricky Herbert before um, the Phoenix made the finals? Yeah, I did. I think it was, looking back on it, I think, and it, even at the time, you probably feel, and looking back on the history of the A-League as well, um, clubs that get their foreign players right um, seem, to, seem to do well. Um, you know, and I think the first couple of years, uh, we, you know, if I put my hand on my heart, I think we, we probably got, I think it was four foreigners, wasn't it, at the time? I think there's, um, you know, we got one or two, one or two, right? You know, and, and, and the rest didn't shine and they were big part players and you can't afford to bring in foreigners that aren't going to be stars of your team. And, and be leaders on the pitch and, and help the young players and help you push into finals and that sort of thing. If you're carrying a couple of uh, foreigners, you're going to have a tough season. Uh, I think you've seen that in, over the years with, with all the teams that we've played. So um, teams that have been strong, have, have you know, had good, good local players, but also good foreigners. Um, and I think that was the difference. Until, 
until I think the couple of years that, that Ricky Herbert sort of really got that right when he had, you know, Eiffel and Greenacre and, and a couple of others, they sort of really gelled and they were a great group together. Um, but the first year, you know, we had a couple of Brazilians, as, as you said, that probably didn't fit the bill. Um, we had Daniel, which was great. You know, he was he was good. He was he was class off the pitch and on the pitch. Um, but you needed to get the four right, especially for a team like Wellington, that if they were going to going to achieve anything, um, needed to get that right. Did you hang out much with Ross Aloisi in that first season? Obviously, the assistant manager here. You played with him uh, in that NSL team as well. Yeah, absolutely. He came over. Obviously, he was he was um, he was captain of the club. Um, you know, it was funny because he, uh, I think he really took to the place. Uh, he enjoyed it. He was at the back end of his his career, of course. And, you know, he had a few niggles and he didn't play as much as he'd like. Um, but he was still that leader, um, one of the leaders for us there. We had a couple, but he was he was definitely one of them. Um, and as I say, we, you know, everybody was, was living within a stone's throw of each other. And there was coffees and there was, you know, drinks at times and, and everybody hung out. So, um but he, yeah, I think he enjoyed it. And if, I'm sure if you, if you asked him today, you know, about his time there, um, I'm sure he'd say he, he loved it. A lot of ex-Phoenix players I speak to always have uh, such great words to say about the yellow fever. Uh, did they really take to you? And uh, was there some relationships formed off the pitch? And uh, yeah, I, I guess it's so important for a startup club to have a, a strong fan base of, of loyal supporters that turn in week in, week out. Obviously, the yellow fever very much is that. Yeah, they were massive for the club. I think, um, as you mentioned, you know, uh, throughout the games, you could always hear them. They, they were great. Uh, throughout the city, um, you'd bump into them and, and have a chat about football. Um, and they were they were great to me. Um, obviously, I was performing and playing well, and, and, and they enjoyed me me doing that for them. Um, but likewise, I, I love their support. Um, you know, even now, if I, if, I, if I ever bump into any of them or see them, it's it's always, you know, great conversations. Um, they they weren't too happy about me when I left the club. Um, but that's that's part and parcel of football. Uh, and I always they always gave me a bit of stick when I went back there and um, played for, for whoever, whether it was Gold Coast, Perth, Sydney, um, always got, got a bit of stick, but I, I respected that. I, um, I love that, that, that side of football as well. Um, and that just goes to show that, um, you know, they really do respect their own club. And, and that's, that's, that's great to see. You need, you need those, those true fans. For sure you do. And I only bring up the yellow fever because of the fact that a mutual friend of ours uh, tells me that Wellington is the best away trip he's ever done. And they're the best fans. <laughs> As an Adelaide United fan, he thinks they're the best fans around. So I thought I'd shoehorn that one in uh, and he'll certainly <laughs> enjoy that, but we won't name him. Uh, now let's move on. So you did uh, rejoin Wellington in 2016, 17, of course, I'll just put that on the record. But uh, so from Wellington to Gold Coast, the new bling team in the A-League or so it seemed initially. Uh, nevertheless, you were an absolute machine for Gold Coast in the A-League. 28 goals in 38 games with a short stint in Turkey lumped in in between. Uh, needless to say, some spectacular memories for Gold Coast in the A-League. Smeltsy, obviously, um, so many illustrious personal achievements and awards that you picked up along the way playing for the club that you play for now back when they were in the A-League. Yeah, uh, amazing time. Uh, I think, um, you know, if you speak to any player that was in that group and that environment, um, you know, almost looks, at, looks back on it as if, you know, it was their favourite sort of period in their careers. Um, you know, I, I bumped into a few from time to time and, and, and keep in touch with, with the old player, but um, they definitely love their time here. I mean, an amazing place to live uh, and just to go training in the morning. You know, we used to train at, uh, at a, a private school here that was on the water. Um, you know, you'd go have coffee after training. So the, just the whole environment was great. Uh, everybody loved living here. Um, and there was, there was a load of hype, obviously, about the team that first season. You know, obviously with Clive Palmer, uh, Miran Blyberg, the coach, um, uh, both sort of out there people and, and, and say it as they see it. Uh, and I think um, from the outside, the rest of the country and the rest of the footballing community sort of deep down probably enjoyed enjoyed having us in the, in the league. Um, 
but on the pitch, on the pitch, we got we got things right. We we, we had a very very good squad. You know, Jason Kalina came back um, in his arguably his prime prime years. I think he was 28, 29 when he came back. Um, we had a lot of players um, that had been sort of almost let go from clubs. Miran sort of used that as as yeah. his, as his Brutman drive and um, good players, but the let go for whatever reason, um, couldn't agree terms or whatever it might be and wanted to prove something. So we had a group that really wanted to prove. Um, I think we, we got off to a flyer that season, the first year. Um, you know, I, I think I scored six goals in the first three games and it just, we hit the ground running. Um, and the only regret that season is, is looking back on it. I think we had an away game to the, to the Fury um, yeah. up north. And we were in a great position, I think, to actually win the league. And we let that one slip. So that would have been an amazing achievement to, to be in, in the league, introduced into the league for the first season uh, and actually to go on and, and win the title would have, been, would have been amazing. Yeah, it's interesting. I was speaking to Christian Rees, a uh, former teammate of yours, uh, who obviously played at the Gold Coast during those years. And, and he was very much telling me that, um, you know, it's, it's interesting how we often look back on the Gold Coast with a lot of negative memories, but people forget how good the Gold Coast were in their first season. So many good players and you, you went very deep into finals, like you mentioned, an unbelievable start as well. It's just unfortunate that um, it all sort of collapsed pretty quickly thereafter, Smelty. Not for you personally. Yeah. Yeah, look, I think, um, look, uh, looking back on it now, I think in the long run, I mean, Clive Palmer, we, we all know Clive, his, his heart really isn't in football. And that was that was the sad thing. Um, because if it was, you know, he's got plenty of money and he could, could still be spending it today uh, in the game that we love. Um, but it wasn't to be. He, um, you know, he saw things a different way and, and he... He didn't like things after, although the first year was amazing, it sort of slowly reduced and, and slipped back after that. Um, you know, I had left, I, I'd been to the World Cup and, and come back and, um, you know, I signed at China, which didn't work. And then I went to Turkey. Um, and so I was gone. And it, it, in that meantime, you know, the, the, the team had sort of been reduced and some players left and gone. And it didn't really live up to what the first year um first year did uh so that was the sad thing you know and and things off the pitch in terms of you know we all know the issues with you know sort of getting crowds through the through the through the gates here at the, at the club and there were some issues around that and i think clive had a bit of a, a ding dong with the ffa at the time um so yeah those things weren't great uh for the game from the outside and i think a lot of people sort of look from the outside and see that um, but from within, you know, that, that first year, what the players remember, um, you know, enjoying the football, enjoying each other's company. Um, and, uh, you know, I guess everyone sort of wishes they could sort of hold on to those moments for longer. Yeah, no doubt about it. I will just say one thing, though, and we're not going to get political here, Smelty, but in defense of Clive Palmer, there was an infamous interview he did with SBS all the way back then, highlighting all his issues with the governance of the game. And he was absolutely slandered for it at the time. I would just love for that interview to resurface at some point, yeah. uh, you yeah, know, yeah. In, in more recent times, because it's amazing how many of those issues he highlighted back before they were public have since come to the surface. So uh, just, just a rare yeah. defense of Clive Palmer there when it comes to football. But uh, Smelty, in any case, you went on and did some fantastic things, despite the fact that Gold Coast did not. Uh, Perth Glory were to be your next team, a very big move for you in your career. 28 goals in 58 games, it's, it's a superb return. Um, for me, when I think of the glory, I truly believe that 2012 season for them was really the year they simply had to get it done. I still think Sydney FC in 2018-19 were just a different beast. Um, so for me, that game in Brisbane was the more winnable one for the glory in, in, uh, back in 2012. Now, you personally, um, on matters regarding your career, uh, I, I would say probably the one player that has most unjustifiably never won an A-League championship. You never got closer than when with that season at Perth Glory. All the amazing moments you had aside, prolific goal scorer at the Glory, 
that grand final against Brisbane having been 1-0 up must haunt you. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, it, it's about six minutes difference, I think, when you look at it, because we were, I mean, that's how close we were. I think it was only six minutes to go in the game. We were 1-0 up. Um, and, yeah, it's a tough moment. I mean, obviously, for me, loved it coming back to Queensland where I grew up, uh, playing in a, in a grand final, you know, 50, 50 odd thousand people at, at Suncorp. Um, amazing atmosphere, family there. Um, and after after 14 minutes, I think it was, I I copped an elbow to the face, which was probably you know, one of the worst facial injuries I've had. Um, ended up getting 50, 60 stitches from my mouth and my nose. Um, any other game, I would have been probably straight off. I think I was unconscious on the ground. I, I got up just through pure adrenaline of being in the ground. I don't know how you kept playing. Yeah, well, I, I, I couldn't breathe, that's for sure, because they, they take my nose up and I was literally just breathing out of my mouth. Um, but yeah, tough moment because I, I was so annoyed at the time because I knew, look, it's early in the game and no matter what you think, um, you're not going to be as effective as you could have been. I still, I still, in my mind, I was telling myself, look, I can still do my job here and, and help us win the game. Um, that was all I, all I cared about. But, you know, I would love to have been fresh and feeling great the whole game. Who knows? It may, may have been a, a different story. We could have potentially put the game to bed. Um, we had a great squad that year. Funny because we actually, although we had a great squad, there was a period in that season where we had a tough run. Um, and there was talk of us, you know, I think at some stage even not even making finals. Um, and we had some very good players. And, you know, the, Tony Sage, the owner, had obviously invested in bringing good players, experienced players in the A-League to, to, to Perth. Uh, and then we just went on a run. I think it was from around Christmas time. We, I don't think we lost a game. Flew into finals. Um, first two finals games, I think I scored, you know, sort of six, seven goals in the first two finals games. And we had a good run. We beat Central Coast uh, under Graham Arnold at the time. And, and we got ourselves into the final. So really good momentum with that team. Once again, really good group that enjoyed, enjoyed being around each other. Um, yeah, it's just a shame we couldn't get over the line there. It was uh, Bessart Barish came to, came to Hornets in the last six minutes. Um, and that sort of famous moment of was it a penalty, wasn't it a penalty? Um, is always one I don't like and I don't enjoy when I see that moment, that's for sure. No, and I think if everyone's going to call a spade a spade, you guys were absolutely robbed in probably the most cruelest moment we've ever seen in A-League history. Um, if VAR was around back then, how different things could have been. But uh, <laughs> again, that's that's been the story of football. Well, I don't know where, where they got it right. That's the question. <laughs> that's another talking point. Um, just talk to us about um, your, your whole time at Perth. Um, spent a number of seasons there. Obviously, um, a club that still hasn't really gotten back to its best from its glory days in the NSL. But like we've sort of mentioned in the last few minutes, that was probably the period of time where they've been closest. Um, but you personally just continued to excel um, some great years in the West. Yeah. Um, once again, similar to Gold Coast in a way, it was like the, the first, I signed three years, marquee, marquee player there. Um, the first year was the best for me. Uh, went over there, you know, new place, new club, new experience, new team that was assembled. And as I say, we, you know, we got to the final and nearly, nearly done the job for the club in the first, first year, which was amazing. Um, after that, always, you know, going to be hard to live up to. Um, you know, a couple of players left, some new ones come in. Um, I was at a, at, a, at a period there, looking back on it, I think after that first year. So I had a, had a very good run for, for a while. You know, Wellington, um, a couple of years, Wellington, Gold Coast, uh, left to go overseas, World Cup in between. Um, then went to come, come back and signed three years at Perth. A very good first season. And then in between that first season and the second season, I think I had Olympic Games as well. So I went and had an Olympic campaign, uh, which was amazing as a player to, to tick off. You've been to the Olympics. Um, and so it was just relentless for me for a number of years. You know, we had Confederations Cup, World Cup, and then there was Olympics. So all that in between seasons for me 
Um, and you got to remember, you know, we're on this part of the world. So all these tournaments are big travel. Um, and it sort of caught up with me right at that moment. And I remember getting uh, a, another sort of injury um, in, my, in my hip. Um, and it, it sort of affected me and I sort of left it. I thought I had an off season after the Olympics. I had a bit of a break and it didn't go away. Um, I probably needed to get something sorted straight away and then have a rest. And I, and I came back into pre-season and I was carrying an injury. Uh, then I needed a little operation on my hip, which took another two, three months. So things sort of just took a step back from that first season and, and those those previous sort of four or five years. Um, so that was a hard moment there. And then it's, you know, that second season, there was a, there was a change of coach, um, some more player changes and things just changed at the club. Um, so it was never quite the same as that first season. So um, once again, in terms of enjoyment, that first year was great. Second year, it sort of uh, wasn't quite the same. And then the third year, you know, I was there and um, was trying to get back on track with new coaches and new players and all that sort of stuff. But, and then I ended up, ended up leaving after that. Was Willie Gallus a good bloke? William Gallus was uh, an absolute champion, to be honest. Yeah, still, uh, I still keep in touch with him. He was a great guy. Um, he came over, obviously, the hype around William Gallus. Um, he, you know, physically was at the back end of his career and trying to keep his body in order with his calves and things like that, I remember. But such a professional. Uh, you can see why he had the, the career he did. Uh, mentally strong player, you know, uh, on and off the pitch, a strong character. Um, really shows, I saw there, I mean, I was already myself, was 30, 31, whatever I might have been. Um, he was, I think he might have been 35, I'm not sure, um, when he was injured. I think he was 37. The amount of effort. Was he Was he 37? Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the effort he put in, to get himself back on the pitch. I mean, he didn't need, really, he's come to come to Perth Glory. He's played in World Cups and, and, and at the highest level for how many years? Uh, 37, the effort he put in to get back on the pitch. Um, I saw his rehab, you know, day in, day out, uh, the way he'd sort of look after himself and he, he, he put the effort in and it was it was just great to see for, for anyone, I think so. But no, really good guy. Um, you know, I had many times we went out for dinner and chats and, and got to know him really well. Uh, and as I say, still still keep in touch with him today. Would you say the most famous player you ever played with at club level? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I there mean, what a career. Yeah, absolutely. Illustrious. Um, so from Perth, you then sign with Sydney FC in 2014 43 games smelty uh, some very happy memories in sydney unfortunately uh you departed just a few months before they won the a league which uh i'm sure maybe annoyed you a little bit but um so some some great years playing for sydney fc and you really got to see them on their path towards rebuilding uh, obviously a massive club that had had some some struggling years and uh they were really you know on the path to the final form under graham arnold which we ended up seeing eventually, but uh, you were there for the beginning of that rebuild at least. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, I think for me, when I left Perth, I, I had the option obviously to, get, to go to Sydney. Um, I had the discussion with them and I sort of really wanted to make that happen. I thought that for myself, you know, playing, I wanted to play for one of the, arguably one of the, the bigger clubs in, in the A-League. You know, you, you, you Melbourne Vic or you Sydney FC. Um, and, uh, I, sorry, just cut out there, had, uh, had a call. Um, yeah, so I wanted to play for, for one of the big teams, um, went and done that and I knew obviously Graham Arnold was coming in. He, you know, I had a few conversations with him prior to, to going there and, um, you could sense he was going to build something, something strong there. Um. Went there, enjoyed enjoyed the first season. Had a couple of niggles as well, um, you know, injury wise at the start. But then I got got on track and I was fine. Um, and you know, they signed uh, Mark Yanko, who was who was a great striker as well. But, uh, once once again, I still get along with really well. Um, and uh, you know, that was the first time in my career that I in the A League anyway that I'd had to you know 
be a, a bit part player at times, you know, sit on the bench when he was away, I played or whatever it might be. And that's understandable. He was, he was marquee on, you know, whatever dollars he was on and he, he needs to play. Um, but uh, yeah, there was, and then, and then the second season, so the first season was great. You know, we got to the final, as you mentioned before, um, we, we got battered to be honest by, by victory, which we shouldn't have um, because we had enough quality and enough, senior players in our team to, to deal with that. But we got it wrong. We got it wrong on the day and a few things didn't go away as well, uh, which contributed to us um, sort of getting a hiding from the start. And, and the game really won't be a, a fond memory for anyone that was that was there in, in the Sydney shirt. Um, but then the next year, you know, a few players left, uh, as, as, as seems to be a recurring theme that players leave and come and go. And um, we sort of, I think, Looking back, and I'd love to know Arnie's, Arnie's opinion on it, but I think he maybe got recruiting slightly wrong that year. He relied on a few players that he thought maybe could do the job um, and, he, and he didn't really bring much in. Um, and it sort of backfired a little bit. That season wasn't great. Um, I probably paid the price for that a little bit as well. Um, in terms of, I mean, I was there. I, was, I had a contract with the club but and things were all right, but it was... Um, you know, the players that were there were looked upon as, you know, we needed to have a better season and we needed to improve and that sort of thing. And and um, and I sensed, obviously, the way things might have been going. And I, I, I was looking at the back end of my career, I was looking for a different avenue as well. Um, so we just departed ways uh, mutually. And I, um, I went to Asia from there. So, um, yeah, once again, the first season, it seems like the first season when you go to clubs is, uh, seems like the, the best one. Um, and then, and then, whether it's a, a very good season or not, you know, you've either got something to build on, or um, it's hard to live up to that first season as well if you go well. So, tell us about your Borneo adventure, Smelty. Yeah, um, well, before that, I went to Malaysia. I had a half season in Malaysia um, at uh, at Kedah, which is. Um, you know, if people know Malaysian football or Southeast Asian football, they'll know that Ked is a decent club in Malaysia. Uh, one of the stronger, you know, the top sort of three or four sides. Amazing fan base. Um, and it, it was something that I'd never really thought I'd, I'd end up going to do. And I went to, went to Malaysia and I almost think, you know, bloody hell, when I was there, I, I should have come a little bit earlier. I, I enjoyed it. I loved it. Um, as I say, the atmosphere... You know, there was, there was 30, 40,000 people at home games um, going crazy. They treat foreigners like, like gods. Um, you know, really enjoyed it. Uh, scored, I think, 11 goals in 18 games in, in the second half of that season. We won the Malaysia Cup, which is the, you know, the biggest thing for, for the Malaysians. Um, there, was, there was over 90,000 people in, the, in, that, in that grand final. So, amazing moment. Um, and then that was the period that I went back to Wellington for the, for the yep. half season between that. And then I signed the full season in Indonesia as a, um, a marquee striker at the time. They brought in a rule where if you've played in a World Cup or, or a top league around the world, you could qualify as a marquee player for, for one of their teams. I think you know, the league was trying to pipe things up at the time. Um, one of the teams signed Michael, Michael Essien and... Carlton Cole and this sort of thing. So these type of players were going to Indonesia at the time. I went to Borneo FC um, uh, and was, was, was a great time as well. Um, you know, the owner there, uh, Nabil, they called him the boss there. He was, he was great to meet a young, a young boss in charge of that club. And um, yeah, once, once again, I, I really enjoyed that. Real uh, interesting how much of a journeyman you were to begin your career and then ended up being towards the tail end of your career mm. as well. Um, but nevertheless, some amazing experiences. It would be remiss of me not to talk about your international career, Smeltzy, and uh, what a brilliant all-whites career you had. I want to take you back to 2010. Um, now, this was a real special fairy tale moment for New Zealand to qualify. I remember it well. I think it was Bahrain, if I'm not wrong. Um, that you got over in the final hurdle um, before qualifying. And just to have New Zealand in there was was really special. But that game against Italy, I've never seen an Anzac kind of spirit resurface so much because obviously painful memories for the Aussies watching. 
just the previous World Cup, Italy won, and obviously the Lucas Nil controversy. To have you score after Fabio Cannavaro fails to do with the free kick, this was just... Now, I, I was in Greece uh, on a family holiday. We were watching at a coffee lounge in Athens, and I've never actually seen that many Greeks get up and cheer, cheer for a goal. Um, so it, it was just bizarre. And I remember having a few conversations with some of them and telling them that you play in my league and uh, they were just like, they couldn't believe it. Like, what's he doing scoring against Italy, playing in Australia? It was all just a bit bizarre. But um, a real romantic moment, a special moment. You can see in your face after you score the goal, you trying to come to terms with what actually just happened. Am I am I right in thinking that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's funny how you say you you, know, you were somewhere in a cafe in Europe watching, and the amount of people that tell me they remember that moment and where they were at the time is is unbelievable. And I think that's probably the the golden moment of it all is is being able to talk about it still today and probably still in ten years time about you know that moment. Uh, such a small nation. Um, you know, scoring against the reigning champions at the time and, and the big name players and, and everyone they had uh, at a World Cup. I think, you know, um, the moment for me was like as if I had seen it before when I was a kid or something because, you know, I was just in the backyard here in Australia um, setting up, you know, things in the backyard and dribbling around and doing my own commentary uh, about the World Cup and scoring a goal by myself in the backyard. And, you know, to then be 28 years old and, and actually putting the ball in the back in there against the reigning world champions in the World Cup. Um, I think, yeah, that, that whole moment, probably, probably the f five seconds after that goal was probably the longest five seconds of my life because I'm actually sort of thinking, do I go and celebrate this? Like, is it, 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 was, it was surreal because, and half the stadium was dead quiet as well because they were, they were mostly Italians. Yeah. Um, and, and everyone was just in shock. I mean, I don't really know how to describe what I'm trying to ask, but is it almost like that much of a pinnacle of a moment for a, for a professional player that's obviously had dreams at the grassroots level? I mean, do you do you almost do you almost freeze up at times during that game, just thinking, you know, you were where you were? Because I mean, to score is is really just the cherry on top, but. For a guy that was, um, you know, moving from place to place, just trying to prove himself, not that uh, long before this happened, it was just a, a real amazing experience, I'm sure. Just tell us, what was it actually like, just being at a World Cup, leading the line for your country? Yeah, I think I think it's a whole, you know, it's a whole mix of emotions, a whole bundle of things, like, as you mentioned there. Like, you know, we had we had nothing to lose. We had an amazing group of group of players, young men, that were together at the right time in their life. We had a, a core group that had played from the under twenties coming through, um, which was crucial to the group. And then we had some real leaders in the team, and then some other young players. Um, you know, we had Ryan Nelson, who was our captain, who was our leader. We had you know young players like uh, young striker Chris Wood, who's now banging goals in for, for Burnley in the Premier League. Sure um, so we, we, had a, we just had a really good group. And, you know, that whole time, I think it was a period of six weeks, you know, because you go away before the World Cup and you play a few friendly games and things were just starting to build there. I mean, we, we beat Serbia 1-0. I scored against Serbia. We beat them 1-0 in Austria on the way to the World Cup. And we were starting to think, you know, this, we've, got, we've got something here. We've got something special within our group. Um, and no one's going to know that at the World Cup. And we were 1-0 down against Slovakia in the first game. Um, and um, we, we, we scored in the last, you know, the last minute of, of the game. Winston Reid scored, I crossed the ball. Um, and, and that feeling there, so it was the first point ever for um, New Zealand at a World Cup. And, you know, just to, just to have that feeling, scoring in the last minute, and then taking that into the dressing room, we just felt, and then we're playing, you know, four days later or three days later, whatever it might have been against Italy. Um, we went out, walking out with our chests held high, you know, we were ready to take them on. And um, and then scoring after seven minutes against them, you know, we're one, one nil up against Italy now. And then then you start thinking during the game, you're thinking to yourself, well, you know, the, as, it, as it stands right now, we're going through to the last 16. You know, we just, and you could just, 
you didn't feel tired, you didn't feel pain, you could run through brick walls. You, it was just an amazing feeling. Um, and, you know, we rode our luck as well. We literally hit the crossbar or the post and, and we defended for our lives for large periods of that game. Um, but we deserved what we got because we just, we put the effort in and we had, we had an amazing group. So that belief, that belief was there. I mean, the mental strength um, of that team being so small in, at the World Cup was, was, was what got us through. And I think it's almost unheralded on a global scale, the actual extent of your achievements, because undefeated, this is a small island team of 4 million people, undefeated at a World Cup, um, really quite sensational. And I just feel the need to ask, as, as a proud New Zealander, um, I've often sort of compared New Zealand's starting 11 to Australia's at the moment. Um, we're both sort of on a similar path haven't played many matches for a long time at all. And that's even before COVID happened. Do you sort of, where do, where, where do you assess New Zealand right now? Are you happy with where they're at? Because I've often looked at that starting 11 they've got with friends of mine. And I've, I've often said, you know what, I'd, al I'd almost rather New Zealand as opposed to us at the moment. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, a conversation I think has been brought up a, a few times I've had. Uh, in recent years, I think, because, you know, you look at where, yeah, you, know, you know, in the last so many years, you always, in, within Australia, it's always been compared to, you know, 2006 and that, that 2010, that golden generation, you know, and can we, can we get back on track with that? Um, and New Zealand was, sim obviously, 2010 was a, kind of the golden generation there for New Zealand. And can that get back on track with that? And it's always a question. Um, as I said before, you know, with Wellington and with some players overseas that New Zealand's got at the moment, there's some there's some good players. Um, and for the size of the nation, they're actually producing decent decent numbers. Um, it's just about keep doing it. You know, you need to keep this production line of players. Um, and Australia's just in the same position, I think. You know, obviously you've got more players and, and more players to choose from and around the world. But the question mark is, are they playing now in the big leagues? And, and you know, who picks themselves for the national team straight away? Um, and that's, you know, it's a, it's a task for Australia and New Zealand. Um, that's not just going to happen overnight. It's something that maybe the A-League now, because of the, the situation that's happened worldwide and now there's, there's more younger players coming through. I think, you know, when I was playing in the NSL or, or in the early years of the A-League, there wasn't as many young players as there is if you look at the teams today. A lot of teams are pumping through these young players. Uh, and there might be a financial thing or whatever it might be, but in the long run, it may be, may be good for, for the national team um, because these players are getting exposed early potentially going to go overseas. Um, they're getting games under the belt at an earlier age. Um, and you need this, this wheel to keep going um, to produce these players so that you can perform on the world stage. Because if I look at, you know, Australia and New Zealand, to a certain extent, when you go to the world stage, it, you know, we produce decent defenders, decent midfielders. Where are our game changers and our strikers coming from? In, in both in both countries, um, you know, I said I said Chris Wood for the New Zealand. Yes, he's scoring goals um, at the highest level. Um, he's at a good age. Um, where's Australia's striker scoring it in Premier League week in week out? Um, you know, where's New Zealand's next one after Chris Wood? Um, and these countries, you know, Australia and New Zealand need to start producing these players on a regular because you can't rely on one player all the time. Um, and if you're going to perform at the world stage, that's what you need. Um, so, I mean, that's part of the reason why I've decided now to go uh, back into almost grassroots football in a way and, and, and offer my services and help teach young players the ropes early doors um, here on the Gold Coast. It's a place where I grew up. And so it's a region that's always been quite strong in producing players, uh, but maybe not of late. So I want to get back to that as well. And hopefully we can start pumping out some players here that, can score goals, can change games, um, and, and just help the whole cycle of things. Very wise words. I almost think we don't help New Zealand's youth with the way that uh, New Zealanders are counted as foreigners if they're playing for an Australian club. 
and young Aussies are counted as foreigners if they're playing at the Knicks. I think it's just a no-brainer they should abolish that because for Wellington to have to take care of the country's entire um, professional pathway, I just think is ridiculous. I think that's an issue. Um, obviously, the Wellington Phoenix Reserves playing in the New Zealand League, with all due respect to it, it's it's not as good as the A-League, and I, I just think New Zealand's hindered by that. I want to get your thoughts on whether Oceania and Asia has to amalgamate, though. Because it's clearly an issue. It always was for us back in the day. But for New Zealand, it's a massive issue having to qualify against the fifth best team in South America or whatever it is. I think it interchanges. But um, that obviously never helps. We, we rarely see Oceanian teams qualify. So do you think it's a no-brainer, particularly with Oceania not having many teams even, that uh, the two amalgamate? Yeah, I think it's one that's been debated for a long time. Um, I remember years ago, uh, I think, you know, like when Australia left Oceania, the, the debate in New Zealand was, you know, do, how long do we sit in, in Oceania for? Um, there's your, your pluses and your, and your, your minuses to it, to it all. I think, um, you know, at the moment, so the benefit for New Zealand is that your young, your young national teams um, are almost automatically qualifying for, for your big, your, your World Cups, your Youth World Cups, your Olympic Games, things like this. So you're going to tournaments, whereas before they maybe weren't necessarily going. Australia might have been going or someone else. Um, so, so they're automatically getting these games. So the, young, the good young players in the country are getting experienced that way. On the downside, you know, I mean, Australia on the flip side are playing so many more games. They're playing in, in, in Asia and you're playing against so many more teams, different experiences. I mean, it's not easy going to Southeast Asia. People think you can just go there and win. These countries are pumping in money into the sport. Um, it's not easy. Uh, and that's great experience as well for them. Home and away, there's more games. Uh, it's probably more, more TV rights and money deals that can be done within New Zealand, for example, if they were in Asia, uh, things like that. But it's... Yeah, it's it, it, it's a definitely a sort of a big discussion on whether they should. Um, I think in the long run it probably should because you take New Zealand out of Oceania, um, no other nation is going to going to hurt the rest of the world or any other team. Um, you know, that's for sure. Um, it's it's generally New Zealand is a walk in, so I think you need to you, you probably need to amalgamate them, join them at, at some stage. Um, and make it just one big strong confederation and just see see who comes out of the top from that. Um, it wouldn't be hard for, for Asia to, to put in another group and mix these teams in. There's enough teams in there already. So, um, yeah, I think from FIFA's point of view, looking at it, they must be, they must be questioning, you know, why are we still holding on to Oceania? Yeah, it's been such a wide-ranging discussion. I'm loving every minute of it, but we'll get back on to all things Shane Smeltz. So um, a magnificent career, playing career at least, that you left behind, Smeltzy. Um, such a journeyman-like career, but some amazing moments and obviously an absolute legend down under and in New Zealand. Um, now, I just want to quickly bring you forward to the present day. Um, you find yourself still scoring bangers for Gold Coast in the Queensland NPL. Uh, you work for Clive Palmer recently too, and you also run Shane Smelt's Football, your private academy. Bring us up to date on uh, how things are looking for you in 2021. Uh, yeah, looking good. Um, the, the full focus for me at the moment is, uh, is Shane Smelt's Football. I've, I've, as I mentioned before, I've recently started that. Um, uh, I'm no longer working for Clive. Um, I, I came up here. I was I was at Sydney FC after my playing days. I went into coaching there. Uh, was with the under twenties uh, youth team and the assistant to the NPL. Um, really enjoyed that. Had some some great learning moments at that club and seeing how they're you know looking to produce players. And I think that's helped me now into into what I'm doing now on my own. Um, and just started up Shane Smith's football. So um, looking to spread the word on that here on the coast, um, work with a range of players, um, you know, from, from anywhere from, from the young ages through to, through to 16 and prepare these players and, and just give them additional quality training um, so that they can sort of bridge that gap from when they want to take that next step and they might be asked to go on a trial uh, at an A-League team or they might get something overseas and 
um, just so they don't get a, a big sort of shock when that when that day comes for them. Um, because it's it's tough to go from training two maximum three times a week at, at, at an NPL level, which is the highest level there is here. Uh, they may even be in a in a local club training less. Um, you, you really can't go from that to to any any high level uh, professional environment. You, you're just going to get a big shock. So um, try and prepare these players mentally for what they might face. Uh, definitely upskill them in technique and, and ways to, I mean, I love the art of scoring goals. So try and teach these players that um, and see if we can really sort of produce some players in this region. So uh, not only that, I'll, you know, I'll be on the, I might as well plug it while I'm here. So it'll be, it'll be on the socials. Um, so if there's players in, for example, in Adelaide, um, in Perth or New Zealand, whoever, uh, in Asia where I played, if they want to obviously follow Shane Smuts football on, on Instagram or socials and, yeah, I'll be putting up tips there as well on how they can they can develop their game in, in the art of finishing and scoring goals and things that they can do on their own. So that's I get I guess that's the benefit of, of socials these days is that you can um you know you can learn and study and go and do your own thing from that as well. And um at, get following everyone by the way and um just talk to us about Gold Coast and how that club is looking in 2021. Still scoring, uh, it's a beautiful sight to see. Um, can they go on and do big things? Do you think not perhaps right now, but you know, can we talk about a, a gold coast in at least maybe a national second division at some point in time in the next five years or so? Yeah, I think so. 100%. Um, and I'll certainly be a, a big backer of that, whether it was gold coast United or, or another franchise or the other club or, or someone merging together, whatever it might be. Um, I truly believe there should be and needs to be a uh, an A-League team or, a, you know, it might start off at a, at a second division and build your way up or whatever it might be. But something here um, on the Gold Coast. Two, two or one, one, it gives you the, the local derby with the Raw, although they're actually training on the Gold Coast at the moment and, <laughs> and basing themselves here. Um, but it gives yourself a derby, which I think in those years that I played in that derby, uh, Gold Coast, Brisbane rivalry was great. And I think you need that. It, it, it's you know, there's derbies in every other every other city. Okay, not Adelaide or Perth, but you, you know, Sydney and, and and Melbourne. You've got these derbies, and you need that. Um, there's no reason there shouldn't be uh, another club up this way. Uh, it's a big region. There's a lot of juniors that play here. Um, it just needs to be done right. So, whatever it might be, I know there's talks in the background. You know, I'm hearing whispers that there is talks uh, with certain certain people about looking how they can they make that happen. Um, I know Gold Coast United would have the ambition to do that at some stage. But right now, um, you know, it, it's a club that's done it well in terms of the junior base. And I think they've done that really well. They've got great, great juniors and, and from grassroots level right the way through to the NBL team is, is a club that's trying to do the right thing. Um, so that's something that Gold Coast United in the past didn't have. It, it didn't have the juniors uh, didn't have the the grassroots level behind the club, um, and with that you create something. You know what I mean. So it's uh, hopefully next time it does come up, and I'm sure it will. Um, it'll it'll be done done well and and done properly, and and a team on the Gold Coast will be here to stay. I think you're right. I think it's a very healthy thing to have a team back in the Gold Coast on the national stage, and uh, we'll keep poised to see how that all unfolds. Just to conclude, Smelty, you've got your fingers in a lot of pies at the moment. Will you endeavour to coach professionally one day soon? Uh, something, something tells me I will. I will. Um, I've just recently completed my A licence, um, and it's it's obviously something when I stepped it, uh, into coaching at, at Sydney FC. Um, once I finished my career, that was the avenue that I was really looking at doing. Um, it just happened that for, for whatever reason, I came back here. Um, I had an offer from, you know, Clive Palmer to take a different avenue and I sort of stepped away from football just for a brief, brief while. It allowed me to play again and I was just, I just took a different, different path. Um, but I'm now, I'm now focused on, on doing this. I'm back into football, obviously, uh, in, in a big way. It's my full time role now, uh, with Shane Smiles Football. Um, and I see myself, at some stage down the track, um, definitely following that. Uh, 
it's, it's, it will be an ambition of mine um, to coach at some level. And then obviously once you're doing that, it's just human nature. You want to take it as far as you can. That's, that's my personal drive. Um, right now, my kids are at an age where they're, they sort of need stability and, and, and um, you know, we're kind of settled here right now. Um, and coaching, as you know, can be sort of fickle and you might have to move from, from time to time and chase things. Um, but I'm sure definitely at the right time, um, you, you, you potentially will see Shane Smeltz professionally coaching at some stage. Well, Smeltzy, it's been big, but you are very much a very big guest arguably the biggest we've had on on this platform. Um, it's been a real privilege to unlock some of these stories out of you. You've had a magnificent career. My Personally, my favourite striker um, throughout the history of the A-League, watching from uh, a very young fan, right up until uh, when you hung up the boots. I think definitely the, the, the biggest name to come out of Oceania in the last 15 years as, as a footballer. And um, we've really enjoyed listening to you, mate. And uh, I'm sure everyone has that uh, will listen when this video is out. All the very best with everything. Stay safe in the Gold Coast. And uh, we very much look forward to seeing where football will take Shane Smeltz next. Alice, appreciate you having me on the show. It's been a great, uh, great time talking about the stories in the past. Um, you know, you don't, don't always get to bring them up. So it's um, something I've enjoyed. Thanks for having me. Enjoy the game tonight, uh, Wellington and Adelaide. I'm sure it'll be a cracker and um, I look forward to speaking to you soon. Great stuff. Thanks for watching, guys.